By this time Miss Polly Burton had become quite accustomed to her extraordinary vis avis in the corner. He was always there, when she arrived, in the selfsame corner, dressed in one of his remarkable check tweed suits, he seldom said good morning, and invariably when she appeared he began to fidget with increased nervousness, with some tattered and knotty piece of string. Were you ever interested in the Regent's Park murder? he asked her one day. Polly replied that she had forgotten most of the particulars connected with that curious murder but that she fully remembered the stir and flutter it had caused in a certain section of London society. The racing and gambling set, particularly, you mean, he said. All the persons implicated in the murder, directly or indirectly, were of the type commonly called society men, or men about town, whilst the Harewood Club in Hanover Square, round which centred all the scandal in connection with the murder, was one of the smartest clubs in London. Probably the doings of the Harewood Club, which was essentially a gambling club, would forever have remained officially absent from the knowledge of the police authorities but for the murder in the Regent's Park and the revelations which came to light in connection with it. I dare say you know the quiet square which lies between Portland Place and the Regent's Park and is called Park Crescent at its south end, and subsequently Park Square East and West. The Marylebone Road, with all its heavy traffic, cut straight across the large square and its pretty gardens, but the latter are connected together by a tunnel under the road, and of course you must remember that the new tube station in the south portion of the square had not yet been planned. February 6, 1907, was a very foggy night, nevertheless Mr. Aaron Cohen, of 30, Park Square West, at 2 o'clock in the morning, having finally pocketed the heavy winnings which he had just swept off the green table of the Harewood Club, started to walk home alone. An hour later most of the inhabitants of Park Square West were aroused from their peaceful slumbers by the sounds of a violent altercation in the road. A man's angry voice was heard shouting violently for a minute or two, and was followed immediately by frantic screams of police and murder. Then there was the double sharp report of firearms, and nothing more. The fog was very dense, and, as you no doubt have experienced yourself, it is very difficult to locate sound in a fog. Nevertheless, not more than a minute or two had elapsed before Constable F-18, the point policeman at the corner of Marylebone Road, arrived on the scene, and, having first of all whistled for any of his comrades on the beat, began to grope his way about in the fog, more confused than effectually assisted by contradictory directions from the inhabitants of the houses close by, who were nearly falling out of the upper windows as they shouted out to the constable. By the railings, policemen. Higher up the road. No, lower down. It was on this side of the pavement, I am sure. No, the other. At last it was another policeman, F-22 turning into Park Square West from the north side, almost stumbled upon the body of a man lying on the pavement with his head against the railings of the square. By this time quite a little crowd of people from the different houses in the road had come down, curious to know what had actually happened. The policeman turned the strong light of his bullseye lantern on the unfortunate man's face. It looks as if he had been strangled, don't it, he murmured to his comrade and he pointed to the swollen tongue, the eyes half out of their sockets, bloodshot and congested, the purple, almost black, hue of the face. At this point one of the spectators, more callous to horrors, peered curiously into the dead man's face. He uttered an exclamation of astonishment. Why, surely, it's Mr. Cohen from number 30. The mention of a name familiar down the length of the street had caused two or three other men to come forward and to look more closely into the horribly distorted mask of the murdered man. Our next-door neighbor, undoubtedly, asserted Mr. Ellison, a young barrister, residing at number 31. What in the world was he doing this foggy night all alone, and on foot, asked somebody else. He usually came home very late. I fancy he belonged to some gambling club in town. 
I dare say he couldn't get a cab to bring him out here. Mind you, I don't know much about him. We only knew him to nod to. Poor beggar. It looks almost like an old-fashioned case of garroting. Anyway, the blaggardly murderer, whoever he was, wanted to make sure he had killed his man, added Constable F-18, as he picked up an object from the pavement. Here's the revolver, with two cartridges missing. You gentlemen heard the report just now? He don't seem to have hit him though. The poor bloke was strangled, no doubt. And tried to shoot at his assailant, obviously, asserted the young barrister with authority. If he succeeded in hitting the brute, there might be a chance of tracing the way he went. But not in the fog. Soon, however, the appearance of the inspector, detective, and medical officer, who had quickly been informed of the tragedy, put an end to further discussion. The bell at number 30 was rung, and the servants, all four of them women, were asked to look at the body. Amidst tears of horror and screams of fright, they all recognized in the murdered man their master, Mr. Aaron Cohen. He was therefore conveyed to his own room pending the coroner's inquest. The police had a pretty difficult task, you will admit, there were so very few indications to go by, and at first literally no clue. The inquest revealed practically nothing. Very little was known in the neighborhood about Mr. Aaron Cohen and his affairs. His female servants did not even know the name or whereabouts of the various clubs he frequented. He had an office in Throgmorton Street and went to business every day. He dined at home and sometimes had friends to dinner. When he was alone he invariably went to the club, where he stayed until the small hours of the morning. The night of the murder he had gone out at about nine o'clock. That was the last his servants had seen of him. With regard to the revolver, all four servants swore positively that they had never seen it before, and that, unless Mr. Cohen had bought it that very day, it did not belong to their master. Beyond that, no trace whatever of the murderer had been found, but on the morning after the crime a couple of keys linked together by a short metal chain were found close to a gate at the opposite end of the square, that which immediately faced Portland Place. These were proved to be, firstly, Mr. Cohen's latch key, and, secondly, his gate key of the square. It was therefore presumed that the murderer, having accomplished his fell design and ransacked his victim's pockets, had found the keys and made good his escape by slipping into the square, cutting under the tunnel, and out again by the further gate. He then took the precaution not to carry the keys with him any further, but threw them away and disappeared in the fog. The jury returned a verdict of willful murder against some person or persons unknown, and the police were put on their metal to discover the unknown and daring murderer. The result of their investigations, conducted with marvelous skill by Mr. William Fisher, led, about a week after the crime, to the sensational arrest of one of London's smartest young bucks. The case Mr. Fisher had got up against the accused briefly amounted to this. On the night of February 6, soon after midnight, play began to run very high at the Harewood Club, in Hanover Square. Mr. Aaron Cohen held the bank at roulette against some twenty or thirty of his friends, mostly young fellows with no wits and plenty of money. The bank was winning heavily, and it appears that this was the third consecutive night on which Mr. Aaron Cohen had gone home richer by several hundreds than he had been at the start of play. Young John Ashley, who was the son of a very worthy county gentleman who was MFH somewhere in the Midlands, was losing heavily, and in his case also it appears that it was the third consecutive night that fortune had turned her face against him. Remember, continued the man in the corner, that when I tell you all these details and facts, I am giving you the combined evidence of several witnesses, which it took many days to collect and to classify. It appears that young Mr. Ashley, though very popular in society, was generally believed to be in what is vulgarly termed low water, up to his eyes in debt, and mortally afraid of his dad, whose younger son he was, 
and who had on one occasion threatened to ship him off to Australia with a five-pound note in his pocket if he made any further extravagant calls upon his paternal indulgence. It was also evident to all John Ashley's many companions that the worthy MFH held the purse strings in a very tight grip. The young man, bitten with the desire to cut a smart figure in the circles in which he moved, had often recourse to the varying fortunes which now and again smiled upon him across the green tables in the Harewood Club. Be that as it may, the general consensus of opinion at the club was that young Ashley had changed his last pony before he sat down to a turn of roulette with Aaron Cohen on that particular night of February 6. It appears that all his friends, conspicuous among whom was Mr. Walter Hatherell, tried their very best to dissuade him from pitting his luck against that of Cohen, who had been having a most unprecedented run of good fortune. But young Ashley, heated with wine, exasperated at his own bad luck, would listen to no one, he tossed one five-pound note after another on the board, he borrowed from those who would lend, then played on parole for a while. Finally, at half-past one in the morning, after a run of nineteen on the red, the young man found himself without a penny in his pockets, and owing a debt, gambling debt, a debt of honor of one thousand five hundred pounds to Mr. Aaron Cohen. Now we must render this much maligned gentleman that justice which was persistently denied to him by press and public alike, it was positively asserted by all those present that Mr. Cohen himself repeatedly tried to induce young Mr. Ashley to give up playing. He himself was in a delicate position in the matter, as he was the winner, and once or twice the taunt had risen to the young man's lips, accusing the holder of the bank of the wish to retire on a competence before the break in his luck. Mr. Aaron Cohen, smoking the best of Havana's, had finally shrugged his shoulders and said, As you please. But at half past one he had had enough of the player, who always lost and never paid, never could pay, so Mr. Cohen probably believed. He therefore at that hour refused to accept Mr. John Ashley's promissory stakes any longer. A very few heated words ensued, quickly checked by the management, who are ever on the alert to avoid the least suspicion of scandal. In the meanwhile Mr. Hatherell, with great good sense, persuaded young Ashley to leave the club and all its temptations and go home, if possible to bed. The friendship of the two young men, which was very well known in society, consisted chiefly, it appears, in Walter Hatherell being the willing companion and helpmeet of John Ashley in his mad and extravagant pranks. But tonight the latter, apparently tardily sobered by his terrible and heavy losses, allowed himself to be led away by his friend from the scene of his disasters. It was then about twenty minutes to two. Here the situation becomes interesting, continued the man in the corner in his nervous way. No wonder that the police interrogated at least a dozen witnesses before they were quite satisfied that every statement was conclusively proved. Walter Hatherell, after about ten minutes' absence, that is to say at ten minutes to two, returned to the clubroom. In reply to several inquiries, he said that he had parted with his friend at the corner of New Bond Street, since he seemed anxious to be alone, and that Ashley said he would take a turn down Piccadilly before going home, he thought a walk would do him good. At two o'clock or thereabouts Mr. Aaron Cohen, satisfied with his evening's work, gave up his position at the bank and, pocketing his heavy winnings, started on his homeward walk, while Mr. Walter Hatherell left the club half an hour later. At three o'clock precisely the cries of murder and the report of firearms were heard in Park Square West, and Mr. Aaron Cohen was found strangled outside the garden railings.